educativas sostenibles, redes, representantes de Zero Waste Costa Rica, funcionarios UNED, invitados e invitadas especiales que nos acompañan. El Centro de Educación Ambiental de la Universidad Estatal a Distancia, UNED, les da la más cordial bienvenida a esta Casa de Estudios Superiores y al Seminario Cero Basura y los 12 Mercados para el Manejo de Residuos Sólidos. El objetivo de este seminario es dar a conocer el concepto de cero basura, zero waste, brindar un espacio para la formación de las personas líderes en el campo y fomentar la implementación de herramientas que contribuyan al uso responsable de los recursos y su consumo, para evitar la incineración y la disposición de los residuos sólidos al aire, al agua o al suelo. De esta manera, impactar positivamente en la salud humana y el ambiente. Para la realización de este seminario, se ha contado con la colaboración de la Red Costarricense de Instituciones Educativas Sostenibles, Reyes, la organización Zero Waste Costa Rica y la contribución solidaria de los expositores internacionales, como una muestra de apoyo a nuestro país por su liderazgo en los asuntos ambientales y lucha contra el cambio climático. Esperamos que este seminario sea de gran provecho para todos ustedes. El programa de esta mañana se encuentra desplegado en los monitores de la sala. Invitamos a la doctora Maricruz Corrales, vicerectora académica de la UNED, a brindar sus palabras al público presente. Muy buenos días. Tengan todos y todas ustedes. Good morning, everyone. Sean bienvenidos a la Universidad Estatal a Distancia, UNED, nuestros expertos internacionales en esta mañana. Mr. Richard Anthony, Presidente Zero Waste International Alliance. Eh, Mrs. Ruth Abe, Pre Presidente Zero Waste United States. Mary, Mrs. Mary Alice Pederson, eh, True Zero eh, Waste, el señor Manrique Arguedas, representante de Red de Instituciones Educativas Sostenibles, Redies, que ha sido organizador junto con el CEA. Bienvenida, Sonia, por todo este esfuerzo. Muchas gracias. Miembros de la Red Costarricense de Residuos Valorizables, Red Conserva, Miembros de organizaciones gubernamentales y no gubernamentales, representantes de gobiernos locales y del gobierno central de Costa Rica, representantes de universidades amigas, funcionarios, funcionarias, estudiantes de la UNED, público en general presente y quienes nos estén siguiendo por medios de comunicación. Bienvenidos y bienvenidas a este seminario de Cero Basura y los Mercados para el Manejo de los Residuos Sólidos. Un título que dice mucho y nos crea una enorme expectativa de cómo emplear esas dos herramientas para contribuir con el uso y el aprovechamiento, no solo de nuestra producción, sino también de nuestro consumo en forma responsable y desde nuestras comunidades. Para Costa Rica y en especial para la UNED, es un gran honor que hayamos sido elegidas como sede de esta actividad y encuentro, porque en ello humildemente nuestro quehacer y preocupación por el cuidado sostenible del ambiente hace evidente que ha sido lo suficientemente meritorio y por ello el día de hoy podemos disponer de la presente convocatoria con aliados de múltiples organizaciones en esta lucha y esperanza aún puesta en el cuidado del ambiente. En esta mañana haremos valer nuestra estancia en esta su casa para conocer de primera mano de los expertos invitados y aliados en común cómo evitar 
la incineración y dejar residuos en el aire, agua o suelo, con lo que se nos permita disminuir estos efectos nocivos en, eh, que han conducido a un dramático cambio climático y por lo tanto impactar positivamente nuestra condición humana y por supuesto la de nuestro ambiente. Esto implicará, según se me ha dicho, que comprenderemos cómo diseñar y gestionar productos y procesos que reduzcan el volumen y la toxicidad de residuos y demás materiales, con tal de conservar y recuperar, a su vez, recursos y que además en el intento no se quemen o entierren causando nuevos estragos ambientales. En otras palabras, esperamos con este nuevo saber una promesa de cambio cultural y de infraestructuras que tengan amplia cobertura. Y es que se nos está cuestionando que además el reciclaje ya no es suficiente, porque estamos agotando la frontera de la capacidad para reciclar todo. Y por eso debemos repensar en cómo reducir al máximo los residuos y la basura que generamos, en cómo reducimos realmente nuestra huella ecológica. Nuestro Centro de Educación Ambiental, conocido por muchos ya por el CEA de la UNED, y quien es el anfitrión institucional de este seminario, ha destinado pensamiento y recursos desde 1977 para precisamente atender y buscar soluciones a los problemas ambientales del país. Para ello ha utilizado diferentes medios tecnológicos disponibles de la institución y sus respectivas mediaciones educativas, de manera tal que hemos procurado hacer accesible el conocimiento, los principios y la cultura de la conservación del ambiente en general. En ese quehacer que ya ronda más de 42 años, el CEA ha crecido junto con la UNED y ha aportado capacitación en cursos y talleres como estrategias de actualización del tema y protección ambiental. Se ha involucrado y hallado nuevos aliados con los hoy presentes en esta sala. Ha respondido a desafíos, retos y formulación de políticas institucionales y hasta nacionales, que con más fuerza y apremio han surgido en la última década y que esperamos con este seminario sigamos ampliando nuestra red nacional colaborativa en el tema, porque de hecho la UNED es la única institución universitaria estatal que cuenta con un centro especializado en los asuntos de la educación ambiental. Sus más de 100 publicaciones en diversas temáticas ambientales, libros, memorias, guías didácticas, la serie infantil Mapachín, quien honrosamente ha sido coordinada por Doña Sonia, y demás publicaciones hablan del trabajo y aportes que el CEA ha realizado ininterrumpidamente durante más de cuatro décadas, razones que están de por demás para que sea nuestro representante institucional en el tema y hoy uno de sus organizadores de este seminario. Hoy podremos ser un grupo reducido de ciudadanos y ciudadanas reunidos por la causa ambiental. Hay, pero hay suficiente conocimiento acumulado para hacer de nuestro planeta un lugar más ecohabitable y recuperar mejores niveles de sostenibilidad, especialmente de sus autorregulaciones naturales. Sin embargo, nada nos evita que seamos los responsables de nuestro destino como especie y que con nuestro desarrollo vertiginoso, además asumimos responsabilidad por el devenir de las demás especies. Como dice un adagio, dar una mano a la naturaleza vale mucho y cuesta realmente poco. Así que aprovechemos esta mañana para compartir el sentimiento e interés que nos une y nos hace seguir haciendo frente a las posibilidades que podemos lograr 
para contribuir con la protección del ambiente en nuestro destino común de habitantes de nuestras comunidades y también de nuestro propio planeta. Buenos días. Invitamos al señor Enrique Arguedas, representante de Redies, a pasar al podio, quien nos brindará unas palabras de motivación. ¿Qué tal? Muy buenos días, doña Maricruz. Eh, vicerrectora académica, gracias por recibirnos y por ser anfitriones con Sonia. Eh, siempre es muy grato hacerlo en instituciones amigas. Señor Richard Anthony, pre presidente de Zero Waste Alliance. Eh, Ruth F., presidente de Zero Waste, Estados Unidos. Eh, señora María Alice Peterson, bienvenidos acá a Costa Rica. Todos, señores funcionarios de la UNED, representantes también eh, de las instituciones adscritas a la red costarricense de instituciones educativas sostenibles, redes, representantes de la red eh, de recuperadores de residuos valorizables, red conserva, y tenemos también representantes de la red de desperdicio y pérdida de desperdicio de alimentos de Costa Rica, eh, de la red PDA. Eh, señoras, señores, todos muy buenos días. Eh, como bien lo dice Elena. Eh, trabajo con la Universidad Ertz eh, y coordino la Red Costarricense de Instituciones Educativas Sostenibles, eh, que está conformada por 19 instituciones, eh, entre instituciones público-privadas, instituciones de educación eh, superior y técnica, entre otras. Eh, precisamente y oficialmente buscamos, eh, en su mayoría, Todas las instituciones son de educación superior y técnica, como les decía, y, y precisamente buscamos eh, con este evento iniciar con lo que sería nuestro décimo aniversario también, y nos da pie para, pues el otro año oficialmente eh, generamos eh, nuestro primer, nuestros, cumplimos nuestros primeros diez años. Eh, y buscamos esas alianzas estratégicas en el tema de sostenibilidad que favorecen el intercambio y la cooperación técnica entre los miembros. Así que esas sinergias son necesarias y qué mejor forma hacerlo que en esta mañana, ¿verdad? El señor Howard Singh, historiador político y activista social, escribió, si la gente pudiera ver el cambio eh, que, produce, que se produce como resultado de millones de pequeñas acciones, que parecen totalmente insignificantes, entonces no, durar, no dudaría en realizar esos pequeños actos. Algunos dudan de esto, pero yo coincido con el señor Singh. En nuestro querido país encontramos personas, organizaciones sumamente valiosas, que solo, no solo se preocupan de la situación, sino también que se ocupan para generar esos cambios y soluciones. Y muchos de los que nos encontramos acá, somos parte de esas eh, pequeñas instituciones o grandes instituciones que hacemos pequeños o grandes actos. Cuando Sonia eh, me llamó para conformar el equipo con Anne Marie y con Elena eh, y llevar a cabo este seminario, no lo dudamos, lo pusimos eh, en la mesa de Redis y el trabajo realmente conjunto en red es prioritario en nuestro país, así como lo promueven los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sostenibles, los ODS, en su objetivo número 17, que responde al trabajo en alianzas y en redes. Con estas pequeñas acciones contribuimos a generar espacios para transmitir el conocimiento. Ante un panorama mundial que exige un mayor cuidado del medio ambiente y el sector educativo debe brindar alternativas, ¿Y qué mejor forma de hacerlo que en este seminario? Cero Basura representa una filosofía que impulsa el, el rediseño de productos y servicios, de forma que los recursos utilizados puedan ser reducidos, reutilizados y reciclados. Considera entonces una producción más limpia, pero también uno de sus beneficios es la reducción de los costos y la mejora y la eficiencia que tienen las empresas en su implementación. Además, 
de que al reducir los residuos evitamos el costo que tiene la disposición final en los rellenos sanitarios. Además del costo del transporte de esos desechos, ya basura, hacia, eh, eso, hacia su disposición final. En los países estos costos varían por municipio, dependiendo del lugar donde se genera hasta el lugar donde se vaya a depositar. Ayer eh, me compartieron los datos en el Ministerio de Salud acerca de cuánto eh, eh, cuestan estos costos por tonelada, eh, por tonelada tratada, y varía del municipio, pero puede variar desde 21 dólares hasta 248 dólares. Imagínense que nos trasladamos eh, desde el sur hacia el centro o más allá del, 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 de, la capi, de la capital a transportar y disponer nuestros residuos. Eso es un costo altísimo. Eh, otro atenuante son la cantidad de gases de efecto invernadero producidos en la disposición de los desechos en los rellenos sanitarios o vertederos el, y el transporte de los mismos. Es por ello que desde las instituciones de educación superior eh, debemos aportar en el proceso de construir alternativas de solución. Sin embargo, todos sabemos que, este, eh, que somos corresponsables y es desde el consumo responsable y consciente donde usted y yo podemos aportar con esas pequeñas acciones. Los invito a estar atentos a las propuestas que presentarán nuestros expositores esta mañana y sobre todo tratemos de ver cómo hoy lo implementamos nosotros desde nuestro consumo, desde nuestras casas. Muchas gracias y bienvenidos. Invitamos al señor Richard Anthony, presidente de Zero Waste International Alliance, a pasar al podio. Hola, uh, my name is Richard Anthony. Uh, I'm, it's my pleasure to be here in Costa Rica. Uh, when I was in uh, seventh grade, we had to do uh, notebooks on Central America, and I did Costa Rica, and I loved, I loved everything I read about it. And so uh, when I got a chance to come here about eight years ago when they were having World Cup in Brazil, I spent a week and I'm fascinated. Uh, we came here, we were speaking, I do these lectures uh, pretty much around the world trying to generate zero waste and they have a big trade show in Las Vegas um, and so they asked if we wanted to make the presentation and I did uh, and in the audience was Anne Marie and at the end of the, um, the talk, the end of the class, she came up to me and says, oh Mr. Anthony, you must come to Costa Rica and I said, Yes, <laughs> I would like to do that. And so we brought a team with us, uh, basically ex uh, probably about 150 years of experience into, in terms of, no, nah, not that much because uh, Mary Alice isn't that old, but um, <laughs> uh, a lot of experience working in the field. In my case, uh, I started in 1970 uh, as a really a political organizer working on the college campuses against the war in Vietnam. At the same time, the environmentalists were organizing for the first Earth Day. Simultaneous to that time, in 1968, the, uh, the USA passed the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act because we didn't have any rules about air pollution and water pollution until 1968 in the United States. Well, that set up a whole momentum where where, uh, well, first of all, we won the student election, and I became, uh, I went to the president, I said, I need a job, and he said, You're, you know, I gave all the good jobs away, but I have this uh, dump that was set up on Earth Day, where people bring in their bottles and cans, and they recycle them, and all the volunteers gone, and the administration's on my back, because it's a big mess, so you go in and clean it up, or make it work. And when we went down there, we found that we are, selling newspaper at $100 a ton, making $1,000 for a big bin, and we just turned it into an enterprise. Today, that, that, that recycling center at Cal State Long Beach is still there 50 years later, and is big, they're probably employing 50 students and raising a half a million dollars. Well, that's how I started running a recycling center for four years. Then I worked in an engineering company for four years. I'm really a political science with my master's in, uh, it was uh, international government, 
uh, political theory and public administration. So walking into a new field and, and it's sort of and we called it waste management in 1968. There were no rules. We literally wrote the rules. And the issues became, uh, what do you do with all this waste coming at us? What do you do with it? And all the engineers said, we've got to build a landfill, Rick. We've got to build a landfill. And you get to find a place to put it. It took me about six years. A lot of very upset people not wanting that landfill in their backyard. And what we recognized that everywhere we went, the people said, well, why do we recycle this? Why isn't this re being recycled? Why are you going to bury it in the ground? And what about the groundwater? And what about the air pollution? And they were all right. They're right. We did double-line landfill. We did get a permit. This was the first double-line landfill in California. Uh, but I, today I say it was a mistake. We, we need ultimate capacity for the stuff we can't get rid of, which is about 8%. We can, we can probably recycle 90%. Anyhow, uh, Working in the engineering company, we did some first studies in office paper recovery and then curbside recycling. And then in 1979, I went to work for Fresno County as in charge of solid waste management for half a million people. And really, we didn't have much infrastructure. We had a collection system and some land. Can you move back from the mic and speak slower? Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, speak slower, Rick. So, uh, uh, I spent 10 years in Fresno County, and then I went to San Diego County, where my, here's, here's the deal, this is the last of my personal stories, but what, my, what I learned is that in a de democratic system, the politics change, sometimes every four years. And so, for a bureaucrat, for an administrator, to try to implement a program that was positive this four years, and then all of a sudden, not so positive, it was a tough place to be. But also what I found is this is, a, this is an industry where everybody has a piece of it. Every politician has said that to me, that the one thing every member in the public has opinion on is what to do with garbage. Every politician. So it's, a, it's an issue that we can all deal with. It has to do with our quality of life. Um, um, I put 20 years in government and I spent the last 20 years as a consultant. We've set up zero waste plans uh, pretty much all over the United States, uh, Austin, Texas, Los Angeles, California, uh, Oceanside, California, uh, Fort Collins, Colorado. We just kept back from Baltimore. Uh, in Baltimore, this is a, was a zero waste plan that was actually uncovered by the citizens, the, the city workers union, and from the city workers union, they took it to the sustainability commission and then to the council and was there helping them out. And by God, Baltimore is going to be a zero waste city. So, here's the deal. If, you, if you're religious, and most of you are, or you're Catholics, the Pope told you, you, you got to deal with this, right? No more wasting. No more throwing food. So it's a religious thing. If you believe in God and religion, then that's the right thing to do. If you believe in government, it's the law in Costa Rica that you recycle and you be part of the system. If you believe in government, that's fine. If you're cynical and you want to say, where's the science? The science is here. This guy basically said, stuff exists. We're not going to argue how it got there or why it got there. This stuff exists, okay? Uh, now that it exists, we use it in our, in our lifestyle for survival and economy. So as we started to bring people together, we said we need to have an international definition of what zero waste is so that everybody could buy into the definition and move forward. So the definition is zero waste is a... Con Conservation of all resources by means of responsible production, consumption, and reuse recovery of products, packaging, and materials without burning and no discharges to land, water, and air that threaten the environment and human health. The one thing all human beings, all life on this planet has in common is that we need clean air, clean water, and clean land to live on. And anybody who tells you it's better for them to, it's cheaper for them to produce product by polluting, it's both wrong, it's just wrong. You cannot allow, today that we know, if the product's going to pollute your river, or your water, or your air, or your land, it cannot be done. This is all about children. The, in, the Natives say, uh, Native Americans say, we don't inherit the land from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. And that's the way we have to move forward. 
So is there a place that's the goal? Um, it's not philosophy, it's more an ideology. It's, a, it's, a, it's aspirational. Uh, if you're an engineer, you say, it's impossible, we can't get to zero. So you say, darn close. Any scientist who measures anything measures in 100% total, and if you get to 99, 99.9, .9, you're there, almost there, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a vision. The problem is by, but let me just say this, uh, prior to the end of World War II, every city had mandatory recycling in the world. I don't, I'm, I want somebody from Coast San Jose say that didn't happen here. All over the world would I say that's absolutely true because you need resources to make your economy go. So why would you throw them away when you, when you couldn't get them in? But after the war, we brought people home and had to create jobs and planned obsolescence and we created this, this incredible mess. This entropy. This is the dissolution of everything that's organized is what ends up in a landfill. It's, it's a mess. It's the, the ultimate. You can drive in cities in Europe and as you enter the city you see this giant mountain in front of the city and that's their trash. It's a monument to their consumption. Not good. This is not a good thing. Excuse me. The other part of the, the Soloway solution was that volume reduction. You reduce the volume and make it sterilize well, and that was incineration. As we started to monitor incineration, we find out that there's all kinds of, even if you had the best filters on your, on your, on your stack, there's still these micro, micro particles, little bits of metal and plastic that's in the air that get into your lungs. Incineration's not good. Secondly, the ash comes from the incinerator is pretty much hazardous. But the biggest part for me is that you're burning up your resources. Who here will say that the population of the planet is going to get smaller? We're almost at 8 billion people. Who's here going to say that the resources on this planet are going to grow? They're not. We're using them up. So the bottom line is you don't want to burn your resources. You want to use them. You want to use them for your economy. We, we figured out in California, just as we did the analysis, if we, if we recycled everything, and I'll talk a little bit how that works out, if we recycled everything, it would be the equivalent of reducing all the exhaust from all the cars. I mean, that's huge when you talk about air pollution and carbon. This is, uh, this is from, the club, the, from the Limits of Growth by the Meadows. This, is, this chart really turned me around in the 70s. The dotted line on top is, the pop, is, is resources on the planet, and the big heavy line is the population growth. On the left side is, is uh, what is it, 1900, and the right side is 2010. And as you see, as population grows on the planet, the resources on the planet are diminished. I figured as a student in 2000, and that's where it crossed, that was going to be the revolution, right? But today, today is, it's the impetus. To me, I say, you look at this and say, if there's less stuff on the planet and more people on the planet, why would you waste and throw away your resources? You need to conserve them, part of your economy. So. Now that we decided we're not going to waste our resources, we're going to build an economy that we all can live in, where's our model? Well, what are we? We're life sources on the planet. What is the commonality of all of us? We breathe air, we drink water, and we reproduce. Nature. Nature is our model. Nature is our model. If we do things to fight nature, burn the resources, throw them in the river, what are we doing? We're damaging, shooting ourselves in the foot, aren't we? So think, we think of nature as the model. There's no waste in nature. One discard from one nature is the feedstock for another part of the nature. So that's how we have to look at it. If, you wanna, if anybody wants to get into it, uh, Janine Bennis, uh, Biomimicry. Oh, good book. And it talks about looking at animals and looking at plants and saying, okay, if you want to make an invention, figure out how that works, and maybe that's how you apply it. The other part of this is, uh, and this uh, basic uh, theory of biodynamics, but the bottom line is that uh, what you take today, you may not get tomorrow. There's no free lunch. That is, we consume the stuff today, we're taking it away from our grandchildren. 
I, mean, I talk to these old guys who don't believe it. I say, put your grandchild on your knee and tell them why they won't be any polar bears or lions. We let that happen. Why did we let that happen? Now, you're not doing that here. This is, you are a model for the world. I, when I'm learning from Costa Rica, that you're right up there as one the best place. I mean, a third of your country is a national park. It, it's clean. And people can love it here. And, and I think it's right up with California and Italy uh, as in environment. Now, we all have to do a lot of work. But I'm just saying to you, you're on the right track. You really are. You've got the rules. You've got some of the systems. It's now just involving the public in the process, right? And part of it is, part of it is, is that's it. So your, your free lunch today, our consumption today, is taken away from them tomorrow. And finally, there is no way. You generated all this stuff, what are you going to do with it? Oh, I'm going to throw it away. Well, you're away is my backyard. Can't do that. No more. We now know we can go to all parts of the planet. We know where everybody is and we know what's there. We can't throw our stuff somewhere else. We have to be responsible for what to do. We're not, we're not, there is no way. So, so as we consume products and we manufacture things, uh, this is a waste. And what this shows is that there's all this energy that's being used up, all these materials and resources that are being used up to make the podium or make this jacket. Uh, we had to cut wood down. We had to ship the wood to a carpenter. We had to cut, customize it. We had to paint it. All these resources. There were 71 tons of resources used to make one ton of product. So if you res so why would you waste why would you spend, why would you mine bauxite, make it into aluminum, then from aluminum into an aluminum can, you're going out three different parts of the world, fill it with a Coca-Cola, and in five seconds you drink it all down and you throw that can away. All that energy is lost. Today, you don't see aluminum countries, uh, companies, they're building recycling facilities because there's 99% of the energy used to make that can can be saved when you recycle the can. And, and the same thing applies for paper and metal and plastic, all the resources. The energy that's involved in it is saved in it when you recycle it. If you throw it away, you've lost all that. So uh, this is kind of the theory, okay? This is the, the <laughs> as I've... Uh, did my 50 years, the first four years in engineering, engineering company was, well, well, Rick, you're the recycler. We've just got a contract with the state of California, and we want you to go up to San Francisco, and there's five landfills there, and you're to take a crew and separate out the material and tell us what's in there. Now, this should be the engineers. Why are you picking on me? Okay, fine. So we, we, we've done this, and, and everywhere I've been, when I was in Fresno and was in San Diego, we do waste analysis because we want to know what you're generating and what's ending up in the landfill. Well, what I found is that we could take the materials that we find in the landfill and we can divide them up into market categories. That is, I can sell 90%. 90% of what you're throwing out, there's somebody out there who wants it. Okay, so we look at the market quality, quantity. Notice with these, I start with the yellow, that's textiles. Side clothing, come on. Polymers, that's plastic. These are, if they're separated in the resins, they're very recyclable. Reuse, these are table, tables and chairs, chemicals, your paints, your, your cleaners, metals. Metal. Steel is probably the most commonly recycled item on this planet. You don't have a piece of steel in your hand that wasn't something else sometime before. It's that's what they do. They, they get it, they melt it down, they make new stuff out of it. Glass, ceramics or rocks, things that grind, and paper. Now notice I have paper, I have a line through the paper, right? The top paper is, is your ledger paper. This is high grain, long fiber. High grain, long fiber can be made ten times back into paper again, into writing paper, okay? Now, the last part are the short fibers, like your tissues and your napkins. Uh, these mostly can be recycled back into cardboard, but also, when you look at the tissue paper, the wood, the soil, retressables, which are food, and plant debris, we now have a recipe for soil. Yeah? So, 
if I, if I had all these things, I could make a great compost. I could put it on my farms in Costa Rica. I could grow bananas and coffee or whatever. And if half of the stuff that we're throwing away would be gone. So it's something to look at. And we set up our program and start, and I think that's where we're going to work on in Costa Rica is the organic collection and composting. If you do that, what you have left is these other materials, which there's a global market, and we can sell them all. The only thing I can't sell, nappies. I don't know anybody who wants a bad, dirty nappy. Do you? So, I don't know. So, here, this is called, the new system is, the old system was you take from the environment, you use the material, and it ends up back in the environment, okay? This is known as the closed circle economy, okay? And the idea is that there are two types of basic resources. When you say wet or dry, I say organic technical. So all your organic material, the green circle, from the generator can be turned into soil, it can turn into biogas, it can turn into varied materials, and it goes back in the same circular economy. It stays in the circle. The blue, which is the technical, is your bottles and cans and newspapers. Again, you, there's the manufacturers, there's the use, there's the collection, there's the recycling, it stays in the circle. The red, that's slippage, that's mistakes, it's lack of public education, lack of cooperation, and partly uh, products that are produced that are not technical or half technical and half organic, which is not a lot, it's about 4% of what's out there. But that's the stuff we have to tell the manufacturers you can't make that stuff anymore. Either make it technical or make it organic or don't make it at all. And I would say if, uh, if I was the, the boss of Costa Rica, I would say uh, you cannot sell that stuff in my country unless I can recycle it or compost it because I don't want to put it in the ground and I don't want to put it in the air in the incinerators. So the bottom line, there is no off ramps in the circular economy. That is, once it gets in, it stays in and you use it over and over again. How am I doing? I was looking for that. I was looking for that five minute sign that she's behind me. So there's no, there's, there are no, there are, so the bottom line is we're talking about total use or as much as we can of everything and redirecting them into the right places. And, and part of the reason is that as we keep going in this carbon economy, we are putting methane in the atmosphere. And the methane, of course, is melting the icebergs and causing the seawater. And I think that's going to be a problem for Costa Rica. You've got a lot of coastal area, you'll be underwater. We don't want this to happen. So the way this works is that in, in management, and if you're a government administrator, you know this. On the first thing, as, as, a, as, a, as a political official, our job as political is to make rules. Make rules, level the playing field so that those people out there in the city can make economy work and not be jeopardized by the government. Make rules, make it fair for everybody. That's important. So part of, one of the rules would be that if you want to have a factory, you shouldn't have any waste. And Mary Alice will talk about the true program, which is, which is where we spend a lot of time working with, with uh, corporations and private sector to say, you know, if you went to zero waste, it would be huge savings for you. And what they found out during the recession was that even though they weren't selling a lot of product, if they could cut back on wasting, they were still able to make money. And that's a real important. We have a lot of companies around the world now that are zero waste companies. Toyota, Honda, Hofus, uh, any brewers, Budweiser, any of these guys, because once they figured out they could get the organics and composite, 90% of the waste went away. So clean production. Learn to make a product without waste. Design your product so it fits, so you can recycle it, so it can repair. I want to reuse it. I want to reuse it. I want to reuse it. I want to fix it. I want to repair it. And finally, when it's finally broken or obsolete, then I want to recycle it. I'm still going to recycle it, but I want to reduce and use first. And then finally, you know, take pride, be a steward, be out there and, and show. Uh, I'll give you an example of a hotel we're staying in, the Grand Dioro. Oh my God, she's a platinum in terms of operation. Everything, bulk, bulk, bulk uh, uh, in the shower, there's soap and shampoos all in bulk. They're, they're selling, they're taking the food scraps and give it to a pig farmer, buying the pork for the for the restaurant from him. It's a, it's a whole closed circle. These are champions. This is a product stewardship. This, these are the people we want to show the rest of the community. This is how we want you to act. So I think that's important. 
Then, okay, now you're in charge, I'm sorry, you're in the public works part, and you're in charge of dealing with this stuff, okay? So the first thing I want to do is I want to encourage everybody to reuse. I want to say that there's basically four separations. I want to show you a video of Japan where they have 34. But we can do it in four. We can put all the recycling in a blue bin, in a bin, and all bottles and containers and paper, and that goes to a, a materials processing facility where it's separated out and baled and boom, never touches the landfill. You put your organics, whether it's food and yard, together in a green bin. They do this in San Francisco, Ruth will show you. And they, it doesn't take it to the landfill, you take it to a farm where you grind it up, and, or you take it to Javier, where you grind it up and you compost it and you make soil for community. The, the, the reef part of it is, why would you throw a table or a chair or grandma's old linen in the landfill just because you're moving out of town? It should, it, history, historically, you would take it to church and give it away. I say we collect it, city collects it in trucks and takes it to a warehouse and give the thrift stores a chance to deal with it, the repair guys and the rest of the stuff. Maybe, maybe we use our, our working class population to take it apart and recycle it. So, there's a last piece of some of this stuff that can't be picked up, like uh, paint and fluids and hazardous waste. Uh, we suggest at your transfer stations, the place where materials are being moved, we create resource recovery parks where you can bring in your household hazardous waste. Those people who have small shops or don't have a collection service can bring their recycling and their organics. And everybody goes to the right place. And Ruth, again, will show you some examples around the world of what they look like. So the bottom line is, you know, when we, 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 we heard this forever, reduce, reuse, recycle. We've, we've added, redesign and reimagine. And imagine, imagine a system where things are all linked together because the definition of ecology is, is that everything is connected. So when we realize that, we're, all, we're not asking the public to do very much. We're just saying, make a choice. You've got this in your hand. Put it in the blue bin or the green bin or the black bin. What's the big deal? It's not a big deal. There, this is, now this is my story. Now I'll tell you, the Italians pick up a different item every day. In Kerala, India, you take your organics to the composting facility and the vendors buy. But in California, uh, we have these basic three, three bin system. Blue bin for containers and paper, the green bin for organics and yard waste, and what's left in the black bin is usually baby diapers and bag dog poop. And that's going to the land until we figure out what to do with that. Key to element is producer responsibility. And the producers taking the responsibility with their product and doing this and, and, and basically showing the champions and letting people in the world know that. Just a few minutes on designing for the environment. Um, not too many people my age in the audience, but some, some of them may remember when they made beer cans with the flip tops went off the container and you'd go to a park or a beach and there'd be all these flip tops all over the beach. Well, somebody saw that as an environmental problem, redesigned the can so when you open the can, the tab goes inside the can. Brain, not, not brain surgery, not rocket science, but something, something we have to do. And so part of it is looking at our product and finding out, put the redesign for recycling in, in that combination of you know, the product you're making. You want it to last, you want it to be repaired, you want to be able to recycle it. Clean production system, again, uh, take responsibility when you manufacture, not to make any waste. Uh, I think the best one was, uh, it was a McDonald's factory. They were making cookies, the cookies for McDonald's uh, hamburgers. And it, there was, he had two big problems. One was the, all the clothing, the gowns that they wear, and the other one was there, there was this organic thing. And what happened is there was a sharp corner on the conveyor belt, and at that corner is where the cookie fell down. And some of the cookies ended up in, with, with the other stuff in the trash bin. We just put another container to put the organic in one thing and the paper in the other. It was just a matter of looking at your line and figuring out how to make it clean. That's, again, it's an interesting job for people to do. It's not that hard. So bottom line, what it comes down to now, it's us, right? Pogo said we met the enemy and he is us. And the, it is us because we buy this stuff. Now, if you didn't like what he did with the way he manufactured it, then you should buy his product. I like to say people that uh, 
If you're upset with the product, but you want the product, write a letter to the manufacturer say, I love your product, I hate your package. Change it. Make it recyclable. Make it durable. Make it work. Let's, let the manufacturer know that you're out there, you're buying their products. And believe me, they're, they're sensitive to this. You know, prior to this age of obsolescence, a manufacturer had a repartee with the public. You, you bought their product, and when it was needed fixing, you took it back to them. He fixed the clock. He fixed the radio. You used to have a TV repairman out there. Your TV breaks today, you send it back, they give you a new one. They don't fix it. They don't know how to fix them. It's really crazy. We have to redesign. So as the consumer, you make the choice. And we can change the world by changing our buying products. We still can get the stuff we need. I'm not saying you shouldn't get the stuff you want. But there shouldn't be excess packaging. There shouldn't be stuff in there that's going to harm the environment. If they had to use toxic chemicals to make it, no. Say no. You just say no. You can't do that. So anyhow, let's use our dollars. This is going to be the campaign for the next years. Because we're going to use social media to tell them, you, I think that you're watching right now on, on Break Free from Plastic. You're now seeing advertisements about Coke and different containers in the environment. And the question is, why? Why is this stuff here? Who owns this stuff? The other part is the policy shift, I believe, that's happening in Costa Rica. You've got to make rules. Okay. First thing, you make the rules. Let people understand the rules. You have to educate people what the rules are. And then you have to enforce the rule. Reinforcement, um, that's really important. Uh, but you need two or three years to ratchet it in. But in, in San Diego, we went mandatory on curbside recycling in 95. And we said, if you mess up your bin, we're not going to collect it. Waited a couple of years, and then when the hauler picks up the material, if it's not a recyclable material in the recycling bin, uh, in the recycling bin, uh, he puts a tag on it. Oops, you made a mistake. And he gives the tag to, to the city. The city goes and talks to the resident and says, you must be new in town. These are the rules. And uh, we're not going to find you at this time, but next time we will. And pretty much uh, in 20 years of doing this, maybe three fines. Because people, once they understand what they want you to do, that's the biggest thing. They don't understand what, they, what you want them to do. Let them know. So good rules. Educate, let people know what the rules are. Uh, just on the bottom line, uh, this is a personal thing with me. Uh, um, why, why are we taxing labor? <laughs> We're working, we, got, we don't make enough money anyhow. Come on. We tax the resources. These are the ones that are being diminished. These are the guys who be, should be paying into the trough for making the world better. Not, not the laborers, for crying out loud. So when we recycle, we find out there's two jobs. There's jobs that are created. I don't think, this one doesn't have the one, no. So typically when you look at landfill, uh, one job for 10,000 tons. Incinerator, maybe two jobs. Composting facility, maybe four jobs. But you get into reuse, it's 200, 300 jobs. Why? Not just the collecting, but taking them apart, repairing them. All these things are all part of the things. We looked at Delaware. Uh, we found that, that there was over a million dollars they were throwing in the landfill that they could go into the Delaware economy and about 1,200 jobs that could have been required. And I looked at the, talking too fast, look at the head of the Chamber of Commerce and I said, if I can set up a system in your state that's going to throw a million dollars into the economy and create 1,200 jobs, would you make it mandatory? Yes. Now, it took them eight years to do it, but they, they have just recently done it. But we had to show them, and they had to believe it. And he said, well, that's if you did 100%. What if you only got 50%? Well, half that. <laughs> 500,000 and 600 jobs. What's the problem? Can't figure that one out. New jobs are created. These are good jobs. They're important jobs. They're jobs for the economy. If you want to, and you have to have a lot of people coming in your country, these are jobs people can do. So we say zero waste are darn close. Um, and if you're not for zero waste, how much waste are you for? Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Muchísimas gracias, Mr. Anthony. Invitamos a la señora Ruth A.B., presidenta de Zero Waste USA, a pasar al podio.
Good morning. Thank you so much for uh, UNED for hosting us. Thank you so much for Zero Waste Costa Rica for organizing this whole week. We have been touring around the city and visiting many universities and organizations and getting inspired by uh, what everyone is doing here to create zero waste. And we're very enthusiastic to um, support zero waste in Costa Rica and support your efforts and your leadership. I'm from Zero Waste USA. We are a national affiliate of Zero Waste International Alliance and we work with communities and institutions to encourage them to embrace and achieve zero waste. That is our mission and that's our goal. We were founded in 1996 as the Grassroots Recycling Network because we know that to make change happen, we do need rules and we do need support from the top, but we also need energy and enthusiasm from the grassroots. And so we work primarily with municipalities and cities because cities are the ones that are responsible for cleaning their communities, controlling the um, sanitation, picking up the trash and the recycling, and making sure that the community is more sustainable. So we work with cities to help move the agenda forward. National legislation and movement at the national level is more difficult, but Working at the grassroots level, the closest level of generation, is where we can make biggest change. So I'm going to give you some examples of cities around the world who are embracing zero waste and are on the road to zero waste. I'm going to talk to you about San Fernando City in the Philippines, Kapaneri in Italy, Jutebury in Sweden, Goldberg, Milwaukee in um, Australia, Alameda, California in the USA, and Kamkatsu in Japan. So here is our around the world tour of zero waste. First of all, in the Philippines. So the Philippines uh, ha is a very large population, over 7,000 islands, 95 million in population, and they have a problem with waste. They are also very interested in promoting environment. Like Costa Rica, they get a lot of tourism and they want to be proud of their country and of what they have in terms of natural resources, so they have a ban on incineration. But as a result, they've had waste problems. They've had waste problems that you can see, illegal dumping, burning, open burning. These are the problems that uh, the Philippines has experienced. And so uh, back in 2000, there was a national tragedy there was a collapse of landfill. And at that landfill, there were waste pickers that were living at the landfill to get the materials for reuse and recycling. Over 300 of these waste pickers were killed, and this spurred the country into action. They, uh, the new law that was passed in 2000 required uh, the communities to step up and take action. Decentralize waste management at the local level. That's where we have the most ability to make change is at the local level. So decentralize a neighborhood at the township level. Uh, mandate source separation. Uh, Rick talked about that. Source separating materials into the categories that you can recycle and compost and reuse is one of the most important things that you can do. Ban on burning and um, instituting material recovery facilities at the neighborhood level. In the uh, Philippines, the neighborhood is called a barangay, and we will show you some examples of that. San Fernando City in the Philippines is a town of about uh, 1,500 population. And they are divided into 59 of these small neighborhoods called barangays. And that's where the waste management, the zero waste approach, is happening at that neighborhood level. So they adopted the zero waste principle, San Fernando City, and they set targets for a reduction. And seeing targets is really important because you cannot manage what you cannot measure. So we really need to quantify and measure what we're putting into the trash and recycling and measure what we're doing so that we can then set goals to reduce. And that's what they did in, um, in San Fernando City, and they became a model of segregation. 
So some of their solutions we've modeled in the US. And one of them is a focus on youth. Uh, tomorrow we will be at the Country Day School and we will be very excited to work with the youth um, to develop zero waste uh, youth Costa Rica. Uh, Dennis, our colleague, is here today. He is a part of the Zero Waste Youth USA, and he has worked with uh, youth groups around the world on youth convergences. So we will be focusing on youth because that is where we can make change, and that's where the future is. We, we know that um, we have a limited time on this earth, and so we need the next generation to lead us into um, zero waste. And so in the Philippines, they focus on the youth and they focus on schools. They have a, uh, in a national uh, zero waste youth festival, very similar to convergence that we will be having tomorrow at Country Day, and they have organized and educated youth leaders across the city. If you have the youth energized and motivated, you know that they can make a real difference. Part of it is because as government organizations, we have limited capacity, we have limited money, we have limited time, we have limited resources. But we can rely on each other to help fill those gaps. We can't always rely on the government to tell the citizenry how to recycle and compost. But if we train our young people as our zero waste ambassadors, they can go out into neighborhoods and teach us how to recycle and compost successfully. Zero Waste Italy uh, uh, is an amazing transformation. In the last 20 years, we've, they've gone from a focus on incineration to a, as a solution for waste management to a focus on zero waste and over 200 municipalities in Italy have declared a goal of zero waste, and most of those communities are over 80% recycling. So that is an, a tremendous achievement. They are leadership for the rest of the world. And we know that Costa Rica will be among at those leadership countries. Caponeri is a, um, a small city in Tuscany. So if you've been to Italy, it is the most beautiful place outside of Costa Rica. Beautiful natural environment, beautiful um, uh, villages, and, uh, and, uh, and they want to preserve the, and protect their environment. That city had, um, was threatened with an incinerator, which would have been a polluting. And, uh, and so they decided to pursue the goal of zero waste. It became the first city in Italy to declare a goal of zero waste, and they also declared certain measurement goals, because you can't go from zero to 100%. You can't go from zero or 1% recycling to 100%. You need to have goals and measurements, and it takes time. As Rick said, it can take two years, three years, eight years. We need to be able to plan for our future, but it starts with planning and setting goals. By 2014, Caponeri achieved 85% recycling rate, which is amazing. And now they are really focusing on the last 15% of what's left that still needs to be disposed in landfills. This is a picture of Rosano Orellini and the back of President Barack Obama. In uh, 2013, Rosano was awarded the Goldman Prize, which is the Environmental Nobel Prize. And he was awarded this because Rosano was the founder of Zero Waste Italy, and he was the founder of Zero Waste in Caponeri. Caponeri, being a small town, town, became an emblem for the rest of the country and is now recognized internationally as a leader. Rosano is just a normal person. He happens to be a primary school teacher, but he was concerned about the health of his students, and that's why he embraced and is pursuing zero waste on behalf of Zero Waste Italy and Zero Waste Europe. So one of the things that they do in Caponeri is to really understand what's left over after we reduce and reuse and recycle. We still have products that are problems. And we call these, you know, problem products that we need to figure out what to do. And so they have um, asked their, their companies to redesign their products for recycling and composting. When they did a waste audit, 
of the trash in Ponnery. I found that they had these little tiny coffee capsules and little tiny pieces of plastic um, that were left over and couldn't be recycled or composted. So Zero Waste Italy wrote to one of the premier coffee makers in Italy, Lavazza, and Lavazza wrote back. He told them, we can't recycle or compost your coffee capsule. It's plastic with coffee in it. Can't be composted, can't be recycled. And so Lavazza redesigned the coffee capsule so now you can get a reusable, recyclable, and compostable coffee capsule from Lavazza. That's the power of zero waste and the power of grassroots organizing. This is just a picture from the design lab in the UK. And this is just another example of ridiculous um, packaging. So who needs to uh, shrink wrap their banana? Banana already comes in a perfectly good package, which is a compostable package. At this um, supermarket in Austria, they had uh, shrink wrap bananas. And so the People's Design Lab made a campaign about it. And similar to Lavazza, they said, yeah, you're right. We can, uh, we can uh, sell our bananas in just their skin. The next um, city I want to talk about is Goldburn, Milwaukee in, um, in uh, Australia. And they have an innovative program on city to soil. Uh, they have 28,000 population and they are in New South Wales. The city to soil program is unique in, was unique in Australia in that it got organic materials from the city to compost and bring out to the farms to renew the soil. They have a problem in Australia with drought and they need to renew the soil for agriculture and so they can do that with compost from organic materials from our cities. In the city we make excess um, organic materials. We learned yesterday from the professor at Leeds University that in Costa Rica 58 percent of what is thrown away in Costa Rica is organic material, meaning food scraps and yard trimmings, plant trimmings, 58%. So we know that in uh, Costa Rica, the solution is going to be composting. It's going to be reduction, reduce, reuse, recycling. So the City to Soil program is an example of bringing materials from the city, getting them composted, and delivering them to the farmers who need it. The program was very successful. Uh, at first, you need to have farmers understand that the product that you're giving them is going to be of a high quality. If you give the farmer contaminated compost, compost with plastic or glass pieces in it, he won't want more compost. He want a good quality compost, and that requires good training on the part of the municipality and of the organizers to make sure that the residents and businesses that are producing the compost is of high quality. The program was about soil management, not waste management, because the whole purpose was to renew the soil in uh, the municipality. The program engaged the community, it engaged the residents and businesses, and it engaged the farmers and was very successful. Thus, the residents were rewarded for placing organic material in the bins to collect it and that it was of high quality. And the farmers found really improved results, including things like increased yield of their crops, reduced water uh, use, improved soil structure, reducing the need for fertilizer, chemical fertilizers. So it was a win-win opportunity. The farmers got a better quality crops and these uh, residents were able to divert their organic material from disposal. So these were the results. They demonstrated that they could return the, um, the nutrients to the soil and create a quality product by getting organic material from the city and returning it to farms. The next example we have is from Jutebury in Sweden. Jutebury is also called Gothenburg, and it's the second largest uh, municipal region in Sweden after Stockholm. It's a population of approximately one million in the region. And uh, what they have there is a very unique resource recovery park. Um, 
Rick made reference to a resource recovery park is a place where you bring materials that you don't know how to recycle and compost at home or through the municipal collection. These could be things like furniture, textiles, other things. At the Reuse and Recycling Park in Yutabury, they are creating a wonderful place to come, the social experience where everyone wants to come and bring their materials and, re and recycle and reuse. This is the outline of the park, and this is um, a look at it from the top. So when you drive in with your car, they have personnel to assist you in unloading your materials and they call them shoppers in reverse, right? They are helping you, personal shoppers in reverse, they are helping you unload your unwanted items and those can be reused and recycled appropriately. But they also want you to hang around and learn about recycling and composting while you're at the reuse and recycling park. This is a picture of a dog that can sort materials into seven different categories. So if you think it's difficult for people in Costa Rica to sort materials, if a dog in Sweden can sort materials into seven different categories, can we, right? Um, the, uh, the reason, this is an example of how to make the park attractive. They have a cafe, they have a clown, they have um, a uh, retail area where you can buy things that are, uh, the people have donated for reuse. Here's the example from my hometown, which is Alameda. Alameda is near San Francisco in, uh, in the Bay Area of California, and that's where I live. So this is an example from my town. We have a town of about 75,000 people, and our um, city is really focused on sustainability because we're an island that's very vulnerable to sea level rise. So here is Alameda today. It's an island in the San Francisco Bay, and here is the um, city after 10 meters of sea level rise. So we in Alameda are relying on everybody to help reduce the impacts of climate change because we will be underwater if we are not able to reverse the impacts of global warming. So we're relying on you to help save our city. Alameda needs to be a leader in climate uh, greenhouse gas reduction and zero waste because we are asking the rest of the world to save our city. So we need to be a leader as well. And so we were among the very first cities in California to declare a goal of zero waste and to start achieving zero waste through source separated collection, through bans on disposables, through increased construction, recycling, and many other initiatives to reduce waste and pursue zero waste. This is just an example about how greenhouse gas reduction can be achieved through zero waste. In Alameda, we have a municipal utility for uh, electricity, and we have an uh, issue of transportation and traffic. We experienced a little bit of transportation and traffic issues this morning in San Jose. Um, but in Alameda, one of the biggest impacts we can make to reduce the impacts of climate change is through zero waste initiatives, taking recyclable material and compostable material out of the landfill and recycling and composting them. So we have a grassroots organization in Alameda called Community Action for a Sustainable Alameda, which is a grassroots nonprofit group which is organized to, by volunteers to support each other to achieve the goals of zero waste and sustainability. We work with, just like in the Philippines, we work with um, school children, the youth, to uh, educate them, to have them educate the community on zero waste initiatives. This is Miss Alameda. So Miss Alameda is a beauty queen, and isn't she beautiful? She ran for Miss California in 2010 with the goal of reducing compostable organics out of landfills. So not just save the world, not just world peace, but compostable organics out of landfills was Miss Alameda's goal. And so she has continued to be a leader in our community of zero waste. And because she's Miss Alameda and because she's a beauty queen, people listen to her. So when she first started her program, she started a program called Miss Alameda Says Compost. And she went to the 60 restaurants in town to ask them, can you recycle and compost? You have the infrastructure. Can you do it? 
And they had to say yes, because they couldn't say no to Miss Alameda. They could say no to the municipality. They could say no to the garbage hauler. They could say no to the compost facility, but they can't say no to Miss Alameda. So that's an example of the social infrastructure, community leadership, role models to support our goals. We also work with the schools. These are called the three musketeers, like the three musketeers. And the tree musketeers help to reduce and recycle and compost at their schools. They set a goal for the schools of 75% diversion, and they achieve that within three years. Alameda has also been a leader in reducing um, single-use plastics. So our restaurants are not allowed to distribute any single-use plastics for food wear. So no clamshells, plastic sh clamshells, no takeout containers, no straws, no cutlery made out of plastic. And no cutlery or anything made out of bioplastic because in our town we cannot compost bioplastic. We can only compost fiber. So for, um, if you have a takeout, you take away, you must have um, wood, wood fork or reusable fork. Um, paper containers or reusable containers. And we have 300 restaurants in our town, and over 100 of our restaurants have decided to go reusable over disposable. So that's a very exciting for us. This is a picture of uh, two of our high school students who had did a program to reduce plastic waste. And one of our um, real big generators of plastics in Alameda is boba tea. And boba tea is made out of tapioca pearls. And you drink it, and you have the little tapioca pearls that come in through a big plastic straw. It was their goal to reduce uh, those big plastic straws and those big cups of uh, boba tea. And so they uh, had created a reusable boba kit, which they then sold to, their, um, to all of their uh, fellow students. And then they asked all the boba tea shops in town, if we bring in our reusable um, boba kit, will you refill the tea with, uh, with our reusable um, containers? And will you give our students a discount? And they did. So we have 10 boba tea shops in Alameda, and they all provide a discount to students who bring in their boba tea, tea kits. And the last um, zero waste community that I want to talk about is Kamokatsu in Japan. Similar to Kaponari, they were threatened with an incinerator. They had open burning dumps, which were no longer acceptable, and the government wanted them to build an incinerator. And they said, we can do better than that. We don't need to build an incinerator. So it is a small rural town. One of the things that we've been talking about in Costa Rica is that some areas have more affluence than others. There's more infrastructure in some of the bigger cities and less in the small towns. In the small rural towns, it's more challenging to recycle and compost, but I wanted to give you an inspiration from Kamikatsu how a small rural town in Japan can get on the road to zero waste and achieve zero waste. The residents sort into 45 categories. We're going to show you a film in a minute that they used to sort into 30 categories. Now they sort into 45 categories. So if a dog can sort into seven categories in Sweden, and if residents in Kamokatsu can sort in 45 categories, we can do that too. Here's an example of their resource recovery park. So just as in Sweden, they have a resource recovery park where residents bring their materials for proper segregation and recycling. They also have organics units in their household that create a biogas that they use for cooking. So they put their food scraps in the digester. It then creates a biogas that is used to light a flame that they do cooking on. So they're able to keep the organics at the household level and reuse it on site. This is uh, Sakano Akira, and she is the Zero Waste Ambassador and uh, role model for the Zero Waste Academy. And in a minute, you will get to see her. So a few more Zero Waste ideas, and then I would like to show you a video. This is an edible algae cup from Indonesia. So for a takeaway, instead of a cup made out of plastic, it's made out of algae. And, can, and you, then you can actually eat the cup. Here's Mr. Trash Wheel in Baltimore. We're working with Baltimore, city of Baltimore, which is in near Washington, D.C. in the U.S. 
and they had a problem with trash in their rivers. So obviously they want to reduce trash going into the rivers, but they also want to clean up the trash in the rivers. So Mr. Trash Reel is solar powered, and as trash comes down the river into the bay, it's captured by the Mr. Trash Reel so that it can be properly recycled and disposed. That's Mr. Trash Reel in the Baltimore Harbor. Mr. Trash Reel is so popular that they make plush toys out of him. And he has a Facebook page and an Instagram, and you can follow Mr. Trash Wheel on social media. He's very popular. And the importance of it is not so much that we want to take the garbage out of the river. We want to reduce trash going into the river. So by popularizing Mr. Trash Wheel and keeping him from having to work so hard, school children and others in Baltimore can learn how to reduce waste. Literati is an app on your phone that you can go around and take a picture of the trash or recipient of compost and then document it worldwide. And you can be on a map in, uh, all over the world and you can see what a difference you're making. This is really important for school children. This is really important for others that are trying to understand and make a difference. They, t they have an app on their phone, they take a picture of the trash, they pick it up, they recycle or compost it or throw it away, and then they document that in the World Wide Web. This is a picture of all the literary sites all over the world. And I think we're going to have a big one in Costa Rica of um, people who are picking up trash and recycling composting correctly. This raising awareness, creating the community of zero waste and proper recycling and composting is what Literati does by sharing the results worldwide. Here's Hyderabad. So I was, Rick and I were in Hyderabad in India last year. And I was the first person to pick up trash and document that on, on Literati. So here we go. There's my trash. <laughs> I picked it up and recycled it. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to talk about was social marketing. Social marketing is not social media. It means asking people, bringing them together and asking them, what are the barriers and benefits to recycling and composting? What is the problem? Why are we not already at zero waste? How can we get to zero waste? Well, I may have my ideas, you may have your ideas, but we really need to talk to the people who are in the neighborhoods, in the churches, at the schools, in the institutions to say, what are the barriers to zero waste in this facility? How can we eliminate those barriers and solve those problems? It's through grassroots discussion and, and, and working together that we can solve them together. Community-based social marketing is a tool to achieve the results of zero waste by identifying the solutions and, and minimizing the barriers. This is the most famous example of community-based social marketing. Don't mess with Texas. Has anybody heard don't mess with Texas? Don't mess with Texas is a slogan that they use in Texas, and it's a kind of a macho term, don't mess with Texas. But it was actually a litter reduction initiative that required, um, where the Department of Transportation in Texas saw that there was so much litter on the highway, and they said, what can we do about this? We need to get the people to reduce littering in Texas. How do we do that? Through a slogan, don't mess with Texas. They evaluated who was doing the littering. It was the young, macho men. Would the, would the young, macho men respond to a, um, a, a slogan of, oh, please do your best to keep, you know, Texas beautiful, you know? Uh, what would they respond to? And they found that they don't mess with Texas was resonating with them. So by going to the demographic of the person whose behavior you want to change, and asking them what would make a difference is how you do that marketing. And then, um, very really important to the carbon, to the soil, the city to soil program is carbon sequestration. We can reduce global warming through taking greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere and sequestering them in our soil. Compost is actually magic. And we are demonstrating that through carbon sequestration programs across the country and around the world. Compost can actually reduce global warming when you put the compost applied onto rangeland or farmland that is not tilled. The plants grow, they bring the carbon deep into the soil where it can be sequestered, just like a big tree, a big redwood tree, thousands of, of um, feet high. 
the plants in the soil can sequester carbon in their roots. And this is an example of a marine carbon project in uh, Marin County in California where um, they are demonstrating through the University of California at Berkeley how to sequester carbon in the soil. This is our new Green Deal, which will be all about recycling and composting and creating city-to-soil programs in California, sequestering carbon, and saving um, uh, uh, the future for our families and our children. And we are very excited to be supporting you and your efforts here in Costa Rica. And now I think we're going to show a short video before our break. Thank you, Oscar. In this small Japanese town, residents took the concept of recycling very seriously. They separate their trash into a whopping 34 categories. Welcome to Kamikatsu, Japan, the zero waste town. Hatsui Katayama diligently separates her waste according to Kamikatsu rigorous zero waste program. In the very beginning, so Kamikatsu was doing it open incineration, but people could see that's really hurting the environment, at the same time the health of the people, so zero waste was created. Since the program began in 2003, 80% of the town's garbage gets recycled, reused, or composted. The rest goes to a landfill, but by 2020, the goal is to be 100% zero waste. これもみんな別個に持っていきます。あれにはこっち。土油管が、土油がこちらです。それここがガラス類。ま、分別も大変やけども、あの、簡単にしても全部なんか終わらって、あの、そうせないといけないっていうのも。it's been very tough in the way to gain the uh, understanding of the people. Of course, when they had to separate garbage into 34 categories, which is massive, it's really like just tough. Residents must wash, clean, sort, and then bring all of the materials to the city's recycling center, where monitors such as Kazuki Kiyohara make sure it's being done properly. Signs on each of the bins tell consumers what their trash will be recycled into and how much that process can cost or earn the community. has what's known as a kuru kuru shop, meaning circular, where residents can bring in and take used items for free. There's also a factory where local women make products out of discarded items. We had a lots of like old kimonos or the clothes or these flags not used anymore. So we asked all these bunnies who really had the skills for the sewing, then they made it into a craft like teddy bears or bags or what I'm wearing right now as well. It's made out of all this uh, fish flat that we celebrate and then use it for the children's day. Businesses all over Kamikatsu have incorporated ways to become zero waste. 
we are cutting by doing the recycling the cost um, into one third compared to when we actually burn everything. We are trying to focus more in how can we change our lifestyles to not to produce any waste. Even in this small town with only 1,700 people, everyone look at each other and they look after or take care of each other. So this kind of supporting system within the community really helped for the implementation of zero waste. Let us know if you have any unique tips for reducing your environmental impact in the comments below. And be sure to check out this next episode. Two years of trash in this tiny little jar. My values are having a really low environmental impact. I have to live like I want that. And so that's why I decided to change. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Abby. <laughs> Invitamos al público presente a tomar un refrigerio en el comedor que se encuentra al lado. Se les, se les solicita llegar eh, y continuar con el seminario en 15 minutos, por favor. Muchísimas gracias.